Luke chapter 15, we will read from verse 1. Luke chapter 15 from verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Especially these words, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. The scribes and the Pharisees murmured at Christ. They were offended uh, by him and, and what he was doing. Uh, he, Jesus was having close dealings with those who were considered to be moral outcasts. They were rejected by society. The general principle is that a man is known by his friends. And they thought, or they claimed that the Lord must have some secret sympathy with the character of those he was with. Well, they were wrong. The Lord, did, the Lord Jesus did not have any secret sympathy with their character, but he did have compassion on their condition. He was a divine physician coming for the spiritually sick. It was this compassion of Christ that drew these sinners to him, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Jesus was willing to receive sinners. He was willing to have close dealings with them, not to permit them to go on in sin, but to save them from their sin. The Lord Jesus is like a doctor, willing to come close to his patients in order to help them, provide a cure for them. The Lord Jesus was willing that sinners would draw near to him so that he could help them, that, that he could cure their souls. And so it's interesting to take notice of this, that when the enemies of Christ said, this man receiveth sinners, they were grumbling about it. The Lord Jesus did not refute them. He did not say they were wrong. He didn't say they were mistaken. No, what they said was the truth. This man does receive sinners. He does have close dealings with them. And the Lord explains his procedure by the three parables uh, in this chapter. The first two parables describe his active love, his seeking love, going out to the sinner, finding the sinner. And the third parable of the prodigal son describes the Lord Jesus Christ receiving love. He is welcoming the sinner. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. He is willing to have a feast with them. He is calling them to come to him that they would come and be saved, that they would come and have fellowship with him. With the Lord's help this evening, we will focus upon uh, this text before us and look at, first of all, the person, and that is what they say, this man, this man receiveth sinners. In the second place, the reception, this man receiveth sinners. He receives them, the reception. And thirdly, the communion. He eats with them. This man receives sinners and eats with them. And that's communion. At least it is pointing us to the communion that Christ has with those who come to him. Sinners such as they are, if they draw near to him, if they come to Jesus, he will receive them and have fellowship with them. Do you desire to have fellowship with Christ? Do you desire to draw near to him? Or are you quite content to see others draw near to him? Others can have fellowship with Christ. I have my own friends. I can go on my own way and be as happy as ever. Oh, what a hard, hard state to be in. And you need Christ more than, 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 than others, more than anyone I should say. We all need Christ. 
But to be in that state, oh, how you need a Savior to, to send the conviction of the law, the arrows of the King. Yes, it's Christ, the great prophet who speaks to us by his word and spirit and sends the arrows of conviction into our hearts to strike us down that we would see our need of a great high priest to wash us in his precious blood so that we would desire to come to Christ. We would see our need of him and long to have him as our own savior to take away our guilt and bring us to heaven by his righteousness. Well, what a wonder this is before us. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. He eats with them. He's willing to have dealings, close dealings with you, friend. Only come to him and he will be your friend indeed. The person, this man, the reception, he receives sinners and the communion, he eats with them. The person, the reception and the communion. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. What we read here is a, an amazing thing. It wasn't the righteous who were drawing near to him. It wasn't uh, the doctors of the law who were coming to him. It wasn't the chief priests and elders that were drawing near to him. Sinners were drawing near to him. The rejects the scum of society, those who were looked down upon, despised publicans, they were drawing near. Yes, it, it is in the uh, imperfect tense in the Greek, so we know that this is a continuous action. They kept on drawing near to him. This is not just a one-time event. They kept on drawing near to Christ. The question is, why were they drawing near to him? Why were these sinners these publicans and sinners drawing near to Christ. Well, perhaps even they themselves couldn't explain why. Not exactly. They couldn't always articulate what it was that drew them to Christ. Perhaps they could not tell what it was, but they could feel what it was. They felt power from Christ, the power of his presence, perhaps and compassion that seemed to radiate from him. It had this inevitable effect. It drew them to Christ. It was grace and love drawing sinners to Christ. They were attracted to him. What was the secret of this? Well, everyone else seemed to be against them. Everyone else was opposed to them, but not Christ. Christ. He was for them. He was willing that these sinners draw near to him. He wasn't turning them away. He didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world, to use the Apostle John's words. Yes, it is his own word that condemns the sinner. There is no doubt about that. But the coming of Christ was for this express purpose, to seek and to save that which was lost. To use the words of another, it was compassion for the chief of sinners that was beaming in his eyes and streaming forth from his lips. Yes, it was God in the heart of Christ. Heaven was in the voice of Christ. God himself seems to draw near even to these sinners with melting love. Yes, the, the picture brought before us in the, in the, the father uh, receiving the prodigal son, that's a picture of God. The picture of the heart of the father in heaven receiving sinners. This is what Jesus is, is explaining to them. I'm receiving sinners and, and, th and, and this, is what, this is what is happening. It's God receiving sinners. He's, he's explaining his procedure and of course he identifies with the Father in heaven. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And so it is God himself revealing himself in Christ in his goodness, in his grace, his 
reception of sinners. But this person uh, who uh, they were drawn to is the man Christ Jesus. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. They were saying of him, and no one spoke like this man. That's what the officers said when they were sent to arrest him. Never man spake like this man. That's why we, we couldn't help just sit there and listen to him. We, we, we didn't have the, the courage to arrest him because no, I, we've never heard anyone else speak like him. How can you possibly arrest someone who has such gracious words flowing from his lips? And here are these publicans and sinners and they're hearing Jesus speak. Never man spake as this man. This man is full of compassion. This man is ready to receive us. And so he did. He was the one who received sinners, speaking uh, to them with grace upon his lips, as we were singing in Psalm 45. Uh, remember the disciples uh, on, and, and Jesus on the way to Samaria John says he must needs go through Samaria. And one reason was that he would speak to a woman who lived there. As the disciples went into the city to buy food, the woman of Samaria came to draw water from the well and Jesus began to speak to her and offer, him, offer the living water, which he himself could give, which was surprising to the woman. And she says, give me this water that I thirst not. And uh, then he reveals the fact that she's a sinner that, and that she had had five husbands and the one she was living with was, was not her own husband. And then she, she's awakened, at least to, to know that this man is a, a good man. He's a prophet. And so she speaks to him about uh, the religious situation uh, in Samaria and, Jer and Jerusalem. But uh, at, at length, Jesus reveals himself to her, I that speak unto thee am he, the Messiah. Well, she goes to the city and tells the men of the city, here's a man who told me every, everything that ever I did. The disciples come back and they, they see Jesus speaking to the woman. Perhaps it surprised them. But Jesus came to speak to sinners. He came to offer sinners living water. He came to receive them to himself. He is willing to deal with them, willing to speak to them. Here is this wonderful, gracious, compassionate person, Jesus Christ. This man receiveth sinners. He's not a mere man. He is, the, he is God. He's the second person in the Trinity, the, the son of the Father in truth and love. The Father sent him into the world to save sinners. The Father sent him to suffer and die for sinners. He is one who possesses both human nature and the divine nature. And these two natures, human and divine, are united in the one person. So the one who is speaking to sinners is God. But what we see immediately is that he is a man. He's with sinners. He's with human beings. And because he has their nature, he can have a fellow feeling with their infirmities. He can sympathize with them. You know, in scripture, humanity is the symbol of compassion. We, we know that from uh, the symbols uh, of, uh, of, of scripture. One of the living creatures in Revelation has the face of a man. Uh, and... The Lord says of his people uh, when, when he is uh, dealing kindly with them, for example, uh, in the children of Israel, when he delivered them from the land of Egypt, he says in Hosea chapter 11, verse 4, I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love. And I was, I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. He gave food to them. It's as if a, a, a very... Um, humane uh, owner of the animal is taking off the saddle and the, and the bridle and everything and providing food for the, for the, the horse or, or whatever. And God is saying, I drew them with cords of a man, not a harsh tyrant, 
not a not a Satan who who is careless and, and, and cruel towards sinners. No, I drew them with bands of a man, with humane compassion. So we read here, this man receiveth sinners. Have you ever considered that the Savior of sinners is a man? Or are you so terrified because he is God and you're not laying to heart, this man receiveth sinners. He's come to speak to us in human nature. That's the marvel of Christianity. To the atheist or to, the, to, to those who are uh, agnostic, well, they'll find fault with that and say it could, it could, it's impossible. Well, we have divine truth. We have that which is incomprehensible, but all the more glorious for that. The beauty of the gospel, the glory of the gospel, this man receiveth sinners. This man who is God, but God in our nature, speaking to human beings like us, this man receiveth sinners. And you see, because he is man, he understands us perfectly. No one better understands the needs of human nature than Jesus Christ. Have you laid that to heart? Because he is man, he clearly shows us his compassion. No one understands us as he does. The one who has true and full, the fullest <coughs> compassion towards sinners. He can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. That's describing the great high priest, but it's also, uh, I should say, that it's describing the high priest of the Old Testament, but it's also describing the great high priest, Jesus Christ. He himself had infirmities, not sinful infirmities. He had sinless infirmities, he had the weakness of human nature. He experienced hunger and thirst and weariness and pain and suffering. And he understands human nature and the deep needs of the human soul. And he has compassion on sinners. This man receiveth sinners. His compassion is so apparent in the Gospels. Uh, he saw the multitudes as sheep without a shepherd. He was willing to feed the, the 5,000. He had compassion on them. He didn't want to send them away to the villages, lest they faint. He cared about their bodies as well as their souls. The poor leper that came to him, full of leprosy, everyone else when he walked past would stand back and let him go by and no, Jesus was willing that the leper would even come to him and, and Jesus even touched him. The Lord is showing his compassion in these ways. He knows the needs of sinners and his very teaching is illustrating his compassion to sinners. It's, it's giving us a clear impression of his concern for sinners when he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He knows our need of rest. He knows that on our own we're toiling, we're burdened, we're weary psychologically, mentally, spiritually. And he is telling us that he has for us exactly what is suited to our need, that which will fill our souls and not leave us empty forever. But he will give us that which is suitable to our inward longings, filling the soul abundantly. As we read in Psalm 107, satiating the weary soul. Isn't this what attracted the public sinners? Uh, they saw that uh, his teaching was suited to their condition. Not like the Pharisees who presented a lot of rules of do's and don'ts. The Lord Jesus in his words saying, come unto me and I will give you rest. This conveyed to them the knowledge of salvation. This told them that here is at last the one that can really help them 
and save them. Have you seen that yet? Are you yet attracted to the teaching of Christ and the person of Christ? Are you being drawn to him? Jesus saying, come unto me. Which Pharisee spoke like that? Which mere man spoke like that and was not guilty of blasphemy? Jesus says, come unto me, I will give you rest. No minister can, can speak like that. I can't give you rest. I can tell you about the one who can give you rest. He says, come unto me, come unto me, and I will give you rest. He has exactly what is suitable to our need. He knows the poverty of those who are wretched and miserable and spiritually blind and spiritually naked, and he gives them everything they need. The spiritual clothing, the eye salve, the gold tried in the fire, everything you could possibly need on the way to eternity. And he's calling sinners, calling them to come. And when they come, he doesn't turn them away. He speaks to them, yes, through his servants, the prophets, in tones of warning. He himself speaks to sinners, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. There was no one who presented the vividness of hellfire as Jesus did. We need the warnings, we need to be awakened. But he also speaks with us, uh, speaks to us with sweet entreaties to draw us, to allure us, to captivate us. His power is manifest in his call. He speaks powerfully, as the Song of Solomon says, his lips as lilies dropping sweet smelling myrrh. There's power in, the, in his voice as well as sweetness. And so there is power in his call, but we might say it is gentle power. Uh, he doesn't gain conquest over sinners by violence and the force of the sword and war. But he does draw sinners, captivating them, calling them, bringing them into his kingdom by the force of truth. Yes, he, he preached he proclaimed, he spoke loudly at times, but it wasn't in the volume of his voice, it was in the spiritual power of his words that saved sinners. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the, sh in the street. It's, it's, it, the winning sinners is not by uh, violence, it's not by commotion, but it's by the truth. And often it's by the still small voice, the word of God and the spirit of Christ together drawing the sinner. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Yes, the Lord Jesus is willing to receive sinners. Someone told me once recently, ministers should be approachable. Ministers should be approachable. And that person was quite right. Now, Jesus is approachable. If anyone was approachable, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. You're full of needs and questions. Are you bringing your questions and needs to the Lord Jesus? He won't turn you away. Even when Nicodemus came, was speaking about something was quite irrelevant in comparison with the great need of his soul. Jesus didn't say, go away, you haven't figured it out. No, he didn't do that. He did speak directly. He must be born again. And he was compassionate and gentle and spoke to Nicodemus. Even though he was a teacher in Israel and didn't know these things that he should have known, Jesus patiently spoke to him about the new birth, about his omnipresence, about the love of the Father, sending his son to die for sinners, about the truth, and those who are of the truth, they come to the light. The Lord Jesus spoke to Nicodemus. He was dealing with him and speaking to him. And in the end, Nicodemus did come to Christ. He showed his, his uh, faith and love in Christ by the anointing of his body, caring for his body when he was 
laid in the tomb. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. The Lord Jesus is willing to receive sinners. Are you coming to him? Are you drawing nigh to him? Are you afraid of him rebuking you? The scathing rebukes that Jesus gave to sinners, and there were some scathing rebukes. They were for those who were devouring widows' houses. They were for those who were self-righteous and persisted in it. Tombs that appeared to be so white and splendid on the outside, but were full of dead men's bones. We're all like that, of course, by nature. We're all full of the filthiness within, within. We need to be washed. But the point is, when Jesus is speaking with sinners and calling them, he's ready to receive them. And he's not going to turn you away. He's not going to condemn you. The law condemns, but Jesus is receiving you. And he says in his word, fury is not in me. Fury is not in me. Isaiah chapter 27. Yes, we're under the wrath of God because of our sin. But in Christ, there is life and there is love and there's mercy and grace. And he's ready to receive you. There's everything in him to attract you. All that you could possibly need spiritually. The Lord Jesus has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The Father has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The Father in heaven is waiting to be gracious. And he's speaking to us through his Son, by his Spirit. This man receiveth sinners. The Lord Jesus is faithful to his word. He says in his word, I have, I said not to the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. You will not seek him in vain. You will not draw near to him in vain. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And God has made provision in the gospel that is revealed even the gift of his son to die on the cross so that it would be right for Jesus to receive sinners. It is a righteous thing for God in Christ to be reconciled to you. In other words, for him to receive you. Because Jesus Christ died for sinners on the cross. By his death, he has satisfied the demands of justice. Justice demanding what? The death of the guilty. We're all guilty because of our sins. We, des we all deserve to die, perish in hell. Justice demands the death of the sinner. But Christ died and gave to justice what was required. And so it is now right for the love of God to flow to us through Christ. The mercy of God in Christ to come and to draw us and Christ to receive us. It is righteous for the Lord to receive us because the blood of the Son of God was shed for sinners and will wash every sinner that comes to Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. This man receiveth sinners. Are you ready to come to him? Is there anything in your heart that feels being drawn to Christ? This man receiveth sinners. This man receiveth sinners. In the second place, the reception, the reception of what? The righteous? Does it say this man receiveth righteous people? This man receives the godly. This man receives churchgoers. This man receives all those who are baptized. This man receives only those who come to the table. This man receives sinners. That's it. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And they were sinners, indeed. There were publicans who were tax collectors. Now, there's nothing wrong with collecting taxes. Someone has to do that. 
But these were sinful tax collectors. They were publicans who worked for the Roman authority and by the Jews, they were considered traitors. How dare our fellow Jews work for Romans and receive taxes from us to give to the to Imperial Rome or the Roman Empire? No, they were not liked at all. Publicans were hated. Some of them would be guilty of extortion, uh, tending to be dishonest and greedy, even harsh, and requiring more pay than the Roman authorities actually required. And they would pocket that money themselves. They were guilty of vices. They were rejected by society. You wouldn't likely see the publican come to the synagogue to worship. They were among those who were outcasts. Uh, they were publicans and sinners. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. They were those who had bad morals, guilty of all kinds of vices, drinking and gambling and all the rest. And Jesus puts publicans next to the word harlots. Uh, he says in Matthew chapter 21, verse 31, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. He says that to the, to the Pharisees or the chief priests. Uh, and and he's, he's, in that, he's saying that the publicans, they are very sinful. The, the word publican represented those who are great sinners, harlots, those who are selling themselves to do iniquity. And yet, Jesus says publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God. Not that they remain these things, but when they come to Jesus, Jesus receives them. doesn't matter how immoral they had been, how filthy, polluted, despised, feeling themselves outcasts and low self-esteem, to use that term which we don't really want to use, but if anyone had felt that they were of little value, it would be some of these people. And yet, when they came to Jesus, he received them. This man receiveth sinners, full stop. We're not a church that looks down on, on people of society because they have ruined their lives by immorality or drug addiction. We are ready to receive them all who come, all of them with compassion, with love, even as Jesus, this man, receiveth sinners. Remember Simon the Pharisee, he invited Jesus to uh, his house for a meal, and then there was a woman in the city. Everyone knew she was a sinner. We don't know that she was a harlot. We don't know what kind of sinner she was, but everyone knew she was a sinner. But this woman came to Jesus. She drew near. She kneels down and weeps and kisses his feet. And the, the tears that fell upon his feet, she dries with the hairs of her head. Jesus was receiving this woman. The Pharisee was not, not thinking that was right at all. This man knew what kind of woman she, this woman was. Uh, he would not allow this to happen. Jesus knew perfectly what kind of woman she was. She was a sinner. And this man receiveth sinners. There was Zacchaeus who climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus, who he was. He didn't know who Jesus was. But when Jesus passed that way and said, Zacchaeus, come down, make haste and come down, for I must abide at thy house, Zacchaeus came down and he received Jesus into his home. But it was Jesus who was receiving Zacchaeus. Even though he was a publican, even a chief publican who was very rich and admitted that he had, although he says, if I have taken anything uh, uh, wrongfully, I restore it full, full, fourfold. It seems likely that he did. And he was ready to restore it. He was a sinner that Jesus received. He was ignorant of Jesus at first, 
but how much more he learned about him when Jesus received him. There was the jailer in Philippi, a hard and callous man. And as soon as he asks, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He doesn't say, if you improve a little first, if you stop being cruel to prisoners, then I'll tell you the answer. Or you can only believe after you've repented a little first. No, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And if we truly believe, we will repent, draw near to Christ, trust in him, and he will receive you. This man receiveth sinners. And finally, the prodigal son, Jesus tells this story. Jesus knows human nature. Jesus knows all the different sinners that have come to him one way or other, through one means or another, all by his word, of course. Uh, the, the, the particular circumstances, Lord Jesus Christ knows it all and he brings it all together in this story of the son who was prodigal, wasteful, who left his father's house having all that was in the inheritance all at once and then he wastes it. And the, and the, and the brother says he spent his living with harlots. He was a wicked, a wicked brother, he's saying. And how, would, how, how can the father receive him? How can the father celebrate for him, the prodigal, wasteful, extravagant son? But the father received him. He came to himself indeed. He saw himself a sinner. He saw that he was bankrupt. He had nothing left. But he realized this, it is so much better to be in the father's house. And I'll just come as a servant. I won't, I won't call myself a son. I'm not worthy to be called thy son. And that's what, he, what he's resolved to say. But when he came to his father, his father saw him a great way off and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. He doesn't finish the statement. He was going to say, just make me one of thy hired servants. But the father interrupts him. He's heard enough. This son of mine is truly sorry for his sin. I'm not expecting him to come with a, a full acknowledgement of all the details of his life and all of his wrongdoings and, and sit for for hours and hours, tell me, son, everything you did wrong. Shame on you for leaving me. He receives him joyfully. He puts a ring on his hand, clothing, shoes. The fatted calf is killed. There's a celebration. Isn't that telling you something about the father's readiness to receive sinners, his compassion, the welcome that you will receive? When you come to him, shouldn't that draw you to him? Shouldn't that make you ready to come to him with trust, believing, dependence, just acknowledging your sin, acknowledging you have nothing, not a rag to lay claim to as some kind of righteousness to present to God, Lord, I have at least this going for me. Please receive me. No, I have nothing at all. Nothing. I've sinned. That's it. Not worthy, that's all. Nothing else to say. If you've come to an end of yourself and you're looking to Jesus alone for salvation, he receives you now. He's your savior, he's your friend. The friend of sinners. The friend, not of the righteous, but the friend of sinners. This man receiveth sinners. And when he receives sinners, he receives them to saving blessings. He saves them from the greatest evil, even everlasting destruction, hell fire, the worm that goes on gnawing. It's a picture of the conscience, the 
accusing and accusing in hell and the, the fire that is not quenched, the, the undying worm and the unquenchable fire, the smoke of their torment ascending up forever and ever, the furnace of hell, that's what Jesus saves you from. From the greatest of all evils, eternal woe and misery and condemnation. And he brings you into the possession of the greatest good. The greatest blessing of all is life for the favor of God. Life, life, eternal life. This is what Christ receives you to. There's a welcome for you in heaven itself through Christ the door. It's not through Allah. It's not through Buddha. It's not through Confucius or any philosophy. It's through Christ the door. I am the way. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Saved forever with an everlasting salvation. Yes, he will forgive all your sins. The moment you come to Jesus Christ, all your sins are washed away in an instant. Perfectly pardoned, perfectly accepted. You're on the same level with Paul and Peter and James and John. Justified. That's what I said. Perfectly forgiven and accepted. Just like that in an instant. Not guilty. Not condemned. By simple faith in Christ. Oh, I could just now sense there's some who are saying, this is too good to be true. It's absolutely true. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In an instant. Simple faith. Full forgiveness. Dependence upon Jesus, absolutely pardoned, not condemned. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Not condemned. Perhaps if it would help you, go home and read a sermon by Spurgeon on the text. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He can say it better than I can. Not condemned. Not condemned. Trusting in Jesus, drawing near to him, being well satisfied with him. That's what faith is. Being well satisfied with Christ. A hearty approval of the way of salvation revealed in scripture. A hearty approval and consent to be saved by Jesus alone. This is all my salvation and all my desire. This man receiveth sinners. Once again, who does he receive? Sinners. Paul says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous. There was a thief that was saved. There was a covetous man that was saved. There was a thief on the cross. There was Zacchaeus the publican. There were, there were harlots who entered the kingdom. There were many sinners. In fact, Paul says, some of you. But you're saved. How is it? You're washed. How can it be? Because this man receiveth sinners. This man receiveth the unrighteous. This man receiveth the ungodly. This man, Jesus Christ, receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Not only does he receive them, he has fellowship with them. In the third place, the communion, he eateth with them. The Pharisees and scribes murmured, they were grumbling, they were complaining, they, didn't, they did not like what they saw. But what they saw was the most wonderful sight. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, revealing the heart of the Father in the parable of the prodigal son, receives sinners. He's receiving them and in fact he's eating with them. Eating with them. Oh, let's not forget that's what the scripture uses to describe fellowship. 
to have a meal together. Jesus said to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, using a meal to describe the most wonderful fellowship between him and his dear people. But look, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. He's dealing with them. He's having fellowship with them. Sinners. Now, Some people might abuse this picture. Some Christians might say, well, Jesus was in the company of sinners. So, so can we. No matter how sinful the environment, as long as we're going to do them good, we can be with any sinner. So isn't there something wrong with that statement? What do we see here? We see that sinners drew near to Jesus. We see that sinners drew near to this man who was speaking to them the truth. They wanted to hear what he had to say. We don't read that he, speaking reverently, pushed the door open inside a a bar and, and interrupted all the drinking and started preaching to them or whatever. That's not the picture at all. He was there. They came to him. And he received them. And we should learn from this. And I hope we are. That we should receive sinners who come to us. Be willing to to speak with them. And teach them. Show compassion on them. Jesus truly cared for sinners. Again when we find Zacchaeus. uh, Who received Christ into his home. Because Jesus received him. Again, the Pharisees were murmuring, uh, people were murmuring that he was going to be the guest with him who was a sinner. But wait a minute. What kind of sinner is Zacchaeus now? Jesus has received him. Jesus is saying in his home, what what do we see Zacchaeus doing? He says, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Yes, Jesus had gone to be guest with a sinner, but this is a repenting sinner. Jesus is not having fellowship with sinners in their sin. He's having fellowship with sinners, but not in their sinfulness, not in their sinful activities. He came to save them from their sins. Not in their sin, not save them to permit them to go on in their sin. As long as they have a a name, Uh, Christian, uh, they can just go on in their sinful activities. Not at all. This man receiveth sinners to save them from their sins. That's why he's called Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. When Zacchaeus came down joyfully to have Christ in his home, there was a, a very... Joyful meeting, no doubt. A joyful fellowship between Christ and Zacchaeus. He would never forget the meal that he had with the Lord Jesus. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. That is so true. Zacchaeus knew it. The woman who was a sinner knew it. Matthew the publican knew it. Matthew holds a feast in his home and invites all the Publicans and sinners to his home. A great feast. All his colleagues came. Jesus was with them. Jesus had dealings with them. He even eats with them. He is willing to have fellowship with you. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Again, this eating, as we've been hearing, is is a picture of fellowship. A mutual giving and receiving. Christ gives grace to us. Christ gives us his love. He gives us pardon. And we give him our faith by his own grace, of course. We give him our love, our appreciation, and our devotion, and our obedience. There's mutual giving and receiving. Summed up in this, perhaps, he speaks to them, and they speak to him. In other words, there's prayer. Are you drawing nigh to Jesus, praying to him? Do you desire to come to him? 
Are you speaking to him saying, Lord, remember me? As the thief said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Remember me, Lord, with that love thou bearest to thine own. Oh, that I might rejoice in thy inheritance. Oh, that I might go to paradise with thee, Lord Jesus. Is that the language of your heart? Are you drawing near to this man, this man, full of compassion, with human feelings, humane and human, full of pity and compassion? This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Oh, he is offering to you this communion. He's coming near to you in the gospel. He's saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. He's standing at the door of what? What kind of door is he speaking of? The door of your heart. Yes, your heart. And he's there, not me. He's there knocking at your heart. Saying, Open to me. Open to me. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. I will come into him. He will come into your heart and he will sup with you. And you will sup with him. He will eat with you and you will eat with him. He will have fellowship with you and you will have fellowship with him. He will speak to you and you'll speak to him and you'll have communion. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly. He's offering the bread and the wine of his body and blood to you. Will you receive him? He's ready to receive you. Will you receive him? He's more willing to receive you than you are to receive him. That is absolute truth. Receive him. Receive him so that you'll be truly blessed. Receive him so that you'll be satisfied in your soul. You're not satisfied. I know you're not satisfied. Only Jesus can make you satisfied. Will you not come to him? Will you not receive him? That you might have true blessedness for your weary soul. That it might be said of you. I have satiated the weary soul and I replenished every sorrowful soul. If you don't know sorrow yet, you will know sorrow. You will begin at, at, at length to, be, to see what sorrow is. It's better that you would not have the total experience of the prodigal son and be reduced to rags mentally and spiritually. Yes, we need to come to an end of ourselves. We need to see our nothingness. But above all, we need to come to Jesus. And he's calling you now to come to him now that your soul would be satisfied as with marrow and fatness that your mouth would praise the Lord with joyful lips. What a wonderful thing Jesus does. He has done. He is doing. He will do. This man receiveth sinners. It's ongoing. He's still receiving them. Will he receive you? Or will you turn him away? He won't reject you. But up to now, you have rejected him. He's ready to receive you, but perhaps you're not so quite ready to receive him. What is the answer? What more is needed? Is it the thunderings of the law? Is it a dramatic experience? life-changing, even tragic experience in your life, what will it take? Would you not rather hear the still, small voice, eat and drink at my table, the wine that I have prepared? Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. Come now, before it's too late to come. 
when the voice will be changed into fury and wrath and even mocking when it's too late and you're sinking in hell and he closes his ears to your screams. Come now, come now, come while all things are ready for you to enjoy the finest of the wheat, even the bread of life. Come now for all things are ready. Perhaps some are not coming because they have despaired of being received. They might think that the day of mercy has expired. They, they may have been convinced or convicted, I should say, of their sin some time ago, but they, now they feel hard and they don't really care anymore. And now that they're settling into a state of despair, Whoever said there's no hope for you? Perhaps it's Satan or your own unbelieving heart saying, no, there's no hope. I have loved idols and after them I will go. That is a lie. It's a lie of Satan and the lie of unbelief. Who does Jesus receive? Sinners. There are no qualifications. Sinners who come are sinners who are received. It doesn't matter how far you've gone into sin, how hopeless you have felt, hear his word now. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And that has been proven true for thieves and theologians, hard workers, politicians, philosophers, mechanics, Scientists, intellectuals, ignorant, doesn't matter. We're all sinners, young and old, rich and poor, ignorant, intelligent. We need Christ. We need Jesus this moment. And it doesn't matter if you're five or 50 or 80, this man receiveth sinners. I was just told by a brother minister, about someone who was elderly, converted. This man receiveth sinners who are young and sinners who are old and elderly. Doesn't matter what stage of life, if you're on the, this ground, this earth, you're on the ground of mercy and there's hope for you. There is hope in Christ. There is hope in this man. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. You say, but I'm too sinful. I'm Filthy and polluted, this man receiveth sinners. He see, receives publicans and harlots and sinners. He receives sinners. You say, I'm filthy. As Spurgeon says, what better fitness for washing than to be filthy? Come to the fountain. You say, I'm so sick, so spiritually sick. I, I have nothing but a spiritual loathsome disease. What better fitness to come to a doctor for a cure than to have a, a disease? Come to the physician. Come to the fountain. Come to Jesus. This man receiveth sinners and he eats with them. He's ready to receive you and he will receive you. Only come. You remember the story of Edith? Sometimes people in the pew hear their name in the sermon and it just naturally perks up their ears. I was preaching once and the little girl looked at her mother and said, oh, the minister said your name. Well, there is a story about a little girl who heard her name in the sermon. So she thought her name was Edith. She, she heard the minister give out the text, and the text was, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And so the little girl goes home, and she's telling her mother on the way home, the minister mentioned my name. Is that right? Yes, he receives sinners and eateth with them. Well, in one sense, that was true. Edith, that little girl, is among the sinners. 
We're all among the sinners. This man receiveth sinners. And God is speaking to you and me as if our very name was in the text. As if there were no one else here but you. He's speaking to you tonight. This man receiveth sinners. Come to him, he'll receive you. And our name is in the text because we're all sinners. This man receiveth sinners. Should you not put your hand up as it were and say, yes, that's me. I'm a sinner. It's not that I feel my sins. It's not that I'm so awakened and convic convicted and, and terrified, but I, I, I know I'm a sinner. And you need to go to the Lord and say, Lord, thy word says I'm a sinner. I can't say that I'm sufficiently convicted and have such uh, awakenings of soul, but Lord, I am a sinner. Please receive me, a sinner. And this man, Jesus Christ, will receive you. Look to him alone. Receive and rest on Jesus Christ. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. May he bless his word. Let us pray. O Lord, enable us to draw nigh to thee. May the blood of Jesus encourage us to come. Oh, that we would see the preciousness of his blood. There's no other hope for us. Oh, that we would then rest on him alone. And we know that thy spirit is offered to us as well to help us come. Oh, that we would then come receiving Christ who receives sinners. Hear us, Lord. Enable us to thank thee for thy truth. Thank thee for the free offer of Christ to our souls. May we be closing in with him. Hear us now, pardon and accept us for his sake. Amen.